Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Spirit. Amen. Amen. Please be seated. Well, good morning. Uh, do you like spooky stories? Like old spooky um, uh, TV shows or movies? Somehow there's this piece of us that likes to get scared every once in a while. So scary movies um, uh, are very popular. When I was a kid, um, uh, Dark Shadows was the show that was on TV. Barnabas Collins, and he'd in, at night he'd become a, a vampire. And just all of, the, uh, all of the scary things about it. We used to love to come home after school and, and to watch it and get scared. Um, <coughs> Well, this gospel lesson starts out as a scary story. Uh, as we see, you know, uh, this, this deranged guy, and so you could, I feel like we ought to turn down the lights and have some flickering, you know, candles in the back and some, maybe some thunder and lightning sound effects to be able to hear this uh, the way it was intended to be given. And, uh, and this, this crazy man who eventually we learn uh, from Jesus is called Legion. Uh, he lives out. Uh, he lives out in the wilderness. Uh, he has. He's, he's naked and he's dirty. His hair is long and knotted. He is. Uh, he's when he comes into the the vicinity of people, they're terrified by him, and so no one has touched him for a really long time out of anything like compassion or caring. Uh, they try to restrain him, and they can't restrain him. And so, uh, so uh, he stays away from civilization. He stays away from, uh, from where the people are. And he finds himself uh, safe among, uh, among the tombstones in the cemetery. He's a, he's, a, he's a dead man walking among the dead by himself hurting himself in the dark. And then, and then, and then Jesus comes. So just to set the context, so Jesus has been on the other side of the Sea of Galilee and, and he's been teaching there. Thousands of people have been coming to him. The great Sermon on the Mount, Jesus has delivered to them. And then uh, the disciples are are excited. The ministry for Jesus is happening. And so people are coming and they're, and they're saying to Jesus, this is great. This is wonderful. What's the next thing? What do we do to follow up on this? And Jesus says, let's get in the boat and go to the other side of the lake. And they said, well, Jesus, we've got, I mean, things are, things are really good here. We can really capitalize on this. He, said, nah. he says, I, you know, we need to go to the other side of the lake and see what it is that God has for us there. And so they get in the boat, and they go, they go on the other side of the lake. Instead of staying where it's safe, they go into the other side of the lake. And you remember in the, in the midst of the lake, there's a storm that comes up. And so the winds, the clouds come in, and then it's dark, and there's thunder, and there's lightning, and the waves come, and it begins to over, uh, come over the bow of the boat. And Jesus himself is just sleeping there. And they say, Jesus, wake up, wake up. We're going to all drown. And Jesus gets up and just calmly, he, he rebukes the waves and they settle down. And the disciples look at him and they say, who is this that the wind and the waves obey him? And so now they continue on their journey and they, they land now in this place. They land in this place at the cemetery. And who's to greet them? Not crowds of thousands who are, who are their fans, but one crazy guy. And the disciples must have looked at Jesus and said, Jesus, I mean, I think, I think, I think your GPS must be off a little bit. I mean, I'm sure that there's a nice little all-inclusive resort down here just a little ways down. Let's go down farther and find a place that's more kind of suitable, more like our people. And Jesus says, no. He says, this is the place. And so this crazy 
deranged, disheveled, naked, desperate, howling man is the welcoming party. When Jesus and his disciples arrive on the seashore. You know, a couple of weeks ago, we, we, um, uh, we celebrated um, uh, the invasion of Normandy. Normandy Beach, 150 some thousand allies who landed on the beach at Normandy. And they call it the beginning of the end of World War II. Well, this is the beginning of the end of the forces of darkness. But there's not 156,000 troops. There's just one. And so only one man, when the boat lands, gets out of the boat and approaches this deranged, desperate, hurting man. Even the disciples, in the entire story, the disciples are never mentioned. It's like they're cowering in the boat. Let's, let's let the boss handle this one, shall we? And so Jesus comes out. And it's just something about the presence of Jesus. You know, Jesus never in his ministry does he ask these demon-possessed, tormented people to come to him. They just come. There is something about, about the light of Jesus' presence that calls the presence of darkness into confrontation. And so this man called Legion comes to him. Legion um, is a term uh, for a Roman detachment of about, uh, about five to 6,000 soldiers. And so, so when Jesus asks him, what's your name? And he gives him the name Legion. Five to 6,000 voices in this man's head, pulling, tugging, depriving him of his sanity, claiming every part of who he is, driving him crazy. But before he seems too far distant from who, who we are and the struggles that we have, so what if we name those demons? What would they be called? Pride? Envy? Lust? Gluttony? Drunkenness, rage, fear, contempt, unforgiveness. We could, we could come up with several thousand demons that assault any one of us. And we oftentimes believe that uh, that if we just if we just focus our attention on them that we'll be able to we'll be able to put them in their place but we fool ourselves don't we because uh, because those demons those temptations have been around a lot longer than we have and the more attention and power that we devote to them they use against us. It's just, it's just part of our makeup. So it's, there's this human psychological factor that, that the more we focus on something, uh, the more it takes control of us and dominates us. Uh, so if I were to tell you, um, don't think of an elephant standing on its hind legs wearing a bikini don't think of that. Don't. Don't think of it. So now I'll just ask you the question, what color was the bikini? <laughs> we can't help ourselves. It's the, it's the truth that marketers know about us. It plants a seed that we need a new car. 
And then, so we say to ourselves, I don't need a new car. My car's just fine. I don't need a new car. There's nothing wrong with my car. My car's got thousands of miles still on it. I don't need a new car. And before I know it, after a few weeks, I'm on the, the salesman's uh, lot looking at new cars, and I'm signing a check. The more we focus on these temptations of ours, the more they have power over us. And so Jesus comes and he lands with force at the shores of our hearts and of our lives and, and asks for our focus and our attention, not on all of these demons that take away our, the contentment and peace that God tries to give to us, but to focus on him because there's this presence, the more that we focus on the presence of this Jesus for us, that all of a sudden the light shines and the shadows are dispelled and we are freed. He says, come unto me, all ye that are heavy laden, and I will give you rest. Take my yoke upon you and learn from me, for I am meek and lowly of heart and you shall find rest for your souls. For my yoke is easy and my burden is light. And so at the very presence of Jesus, the these, these demons are scrambling. They want nothing to do with being in the, in the blazing light of his presence. And so they ask, they say, please don't torture us, which is interesting. Don't torture us after what they've been doing to this guy, right? He said, don't torture us. Just let us go. Where should we go? <clears throat> There's this herd of pigs over there on the hills. Let us go there. And so Jesus gives them permission, and they go. Now, I got I to gotta say something about pigs because, because we can misunderstand this. Um, <coughs> excuse me. So uh, pigs for us, especially as Americans, are wonderful. We have a wonderful relationship with pigs. We are swine lovers in this place. So from the from the time that we are kids, we like Porky Pig, you know, and Wilbur the pig, and, and all of these wonderful images that we have of, of cozying up and, and, and embracing pigs. My kids had stuffed pigs that they could hug and, uh, while they were in bed. And then we have this other part of us, which is pigs are really delicious and we like to eat them. And I don't know I, how we keep those two pieces, those two realities in our head together. We kept them separate, right? Because they're cute ones and the delicious ones over here. And so the, the, uh, the ribs and bacon and sausage, all of those things. So, so for us, pigs are wonderful things. And so when we think about the pigs, you know, kind of going off the, 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 uh, the cliff, we think, oh, on the one hand, that's terrible. That's terrible. Porky Pig and Wilbur the Pig, they're, disaster. they're, they're going to their disaster. Or we think over here and we think, oh, what a waste of great ribs. <laughs> but if we think in those terms... We'll miss the entire point. Um, the gospel writers were Jews. And for the Jews, the pig was a symbol of evil, of dirtiness, of, of contamination. Uh, so the Roman Empire, when they sent their legions uh, to occupy this area, they, they used the, the banner over the top that symbolized the power and authority of the Roman Empire was the boar, the head of this great pig, this boar with big tusks that symbolized the power of Rome to conquer. And when Antiochus Epiphanes uh, earlier had conquered Jerusalem and went into the temple, in order to defile it, he took a pig and he slaughtered it on the temple and sacrificed it to desecrate the temple and offend the Jews. They didn't like pigs. They thought they were evil. And so in order for us to be able to understand this issue of, of the demons going into something and occupying it, we've got to think of, not pigs, for us, we've got to think of something that, that, that we don't like, that's dirty, that, that causes the hair on the back of our necks to kind of go up and gives us shivers. If you see one, kind of like... Rats. 
rats. So there are these herders that raise rats, but these rats are, they're vermin. They carry disease and pestilence. And so the demons, where are they going to go? Where will they feel more at home than in these rats? And so they go into the rats, and even the rats can't stand them. And so they go and they plunge off the cliff. And all of a sudden now, there's freedom. Death and darkness, disease and despair, they're, they're dispelled. And now we look at this man, and, and he's calm. The gospel says he's in his right mind. Somebody comes and, and they bring clothes to him and clothe him. And he sits at the feet of Jesus, which is the, the posture of a, of a disciple, of a learner. And so now, this is the time. So this, this, this man who's been tormented is delivered, and he's, and he's sane, and, this, and, the, and the demons with the rats are gone. This is the time for people to be able to celebrate, right? This is the, so if this was a movie, this, if the Wizard of Oz, you know, Wizard of Oz, you remember the song? Ding dong, the witch is dead, witch old witch, the wicked witch. This is the time for the whole village to come out and to see this guy and to see that these rats are dead. They, they ought to be dancing and celebrating in the streets. But they don't see it that way. They look at this guy who they've been used to being the crazy person out in the cemetery, and now he's sane? And these, these rats, we make our living by these rats. So they're terrified of him. You know, and, and sometimes the idea of people becoming healed and whole is, is terrifying to us. If we live in a world, in a family, in a culture in which everything is based on the dynamics of darkness and we relate from a place of sickness, than to have one person who has a calm mind, who's healed and whole and healthy, is an indictment of the entire system. It, it drives us all crazy. It, it reveals to us how crazy we are and how crazy we want to continue to be. And so we don't, we don't often like the presence of someone who's gotten their life together, like an alcoholic who's been running around with his drinking buddies and now all of a sudden gets sober. And the rest of them are, they don't, they don't like that. I had a gal uh, call the church uh, this past week. Uh, she said she is a mom. Uh, I was a 20 month old um, infant and uh, and she had finally gotten herself um, clean and sober and she called not because she knew me or Father Christian or any of us she just called she just called the church because she needed help because she realized that she got clean and sober but her problems didn't go away her problems were still there and so she needed somebody to help walk her through that and did I know a therapist who I could refer her to and so I did that to be able to have a right mind sane and sober is a gift but a gift easily lost one that needs to be nurtured and strengthened and a story that needs to be told. So these people come out to Jesus and they, and they say, I, 
we don't want you here. You're upsetting our life. We don't want you here. So could you just go? Go, get out of here. And so Jesus, being the gentleman that he is, he, he, as his disciples pack up the boat, and Jesus gets in the boat. And this, this poor guy who's standing there is looking at Jesus and saying, wait, wait, where are you going? <laughs> what, are you, what do you think you're doing? You can't leave me here with these crazy people. These people are crazy. You can't leave me here. And Jesus just looks at him and he says, friend, he says, um, it's the only time Jesus did that to someone who wanted to come and follow him. Uh, Jesus said, no. He said, you can't, you can't come with me. Um, you've got to go home. You've got to go home and tell the story of the wonderful things that God has done for you. Sometimes the hardest thing that God does is to send us back home. To send us home to the people who are, who are crazy, but that God has given to us to be able to offer to them the one gift that we have that's, that's truly worth anything, the gift of our story of what it is that Jesus has done for us. Later on at the end of the gospel, um, when Jesus is coming to Jerusalem for the last time, there are some Gentiles who come looking for Jesus. And the disciples are nervous because these are Gentiles who are looking to talk with Jesus. And the speculation is that those Gentiles came uh, perhaps because they'd heard the story of this man and what it is that Jesus has done for him. We are given this tremendous opportunity to be able to see the presence of Jesus in our lives, to, to focus on him, and by focusing on him, to dispel the shadows of our lives and to live into the brightness of his light and to see him restore us to health and wholeness and to give us the story of his redeeming love. It's the gift that Jesus gives to us. It's the calling for each of us as we come, as we worship, and as we go to the people Jesus sends us back 